Jew. Israeli deportees among those beheaded by ISIS, a beating of an Israeli soldier by Israeli police, Israeli Memorial Day from the Israeli consulate, and more of the Jewish news that's changing your world right now in this episode of the Week in Review. Hello and welcome to the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. Three Christians beheaded by ISIS had reportedly been seeking refuge in Israel but were deported instead. A recent video from ISIS showed the execution of a number of Christians in Libya, and three of them had previously found their way to Israel after seeking refuge from harm in Eritrea and Sudan. They had been deported as part of a voluntary departure program by the Israeli government in which those deported sign a release, are sent to another African country, and are given around $3,500 in cash. The Israeli government is considering forcefully deporting many of the remaining 55,000 African asylum seekers within its borders. Israel has reportedly granted recognition of refugee status to a fraction of 1% of those seeking asylum. But for one black man in Israel, being both a Jewish Israeli and a uniformed soldier in the Israel Defense Forces couldn't prevent him from police violence. Damas Pakata was in uniform and riding his bike in a neighborhood south of Tel Aviv on Sunday evening when he saw a police cordon for a suspicious object. When he inquired about what was going on, Israeli police beat him and then arrested him. It was only after Pakata's family obtained video of the incident that he was released. The two police officers have been suspended. Pakata told Israel's Channel 2, quote, The cop told me I'm doing my job and if I need to put a bullet in your head, I would do it. I am proud of my job. Pakata added, I feel terrible and humiliated. This is a disgrace to the state of Israel. It's because of my skin color. But speaking of violence in the Jewish community, the so-called prod father, Rabbi Mendel Epstein, who's made international headlines for having kidnapped and allegedly violently abused Jewish husbands who refused to give their wives a religious divorce, including with an electric cattle prod, has been found guilty of conspiracy to commit kidnapping. Epstein could face life in prison, as could two of his co-conspirators, Rabbi Jay Goldstein and Rabbi Benjamin Stimler. And in the Hasidic enclave of New Square, a man who committed attempted arson and assault to try to intimidate a member of the community who went to a different prayer service was celebrated this past week. Shaul Spitzer in 2011 placed gasoline-soaked rags under a community member's home in the middle of the night and was stopped from committing the arson by the man he hoped to intimidate, Aaron Rottenberg, who'd been attending prayer services at a nearby nursing home. When Rottenberg wrestled with Spitzer to stop the attempted arson, Rottenberg received significant burns over more than half of his body and was in the hospital for approximately a month. Spitzer, who is now serving a sentence for first-degree assault, was celebrated at a party in New Square for having completed a volume of Talmud. An advertisement in a local publication celebrated Spitzer for, among other things, conquering the horrors that were revealed within our gates with strength. Moving on, Israeli Memorial Day last week was commemorated in many ways. Meredith Gansman reports on one held in partnership with the Israeli consulate. Last week, Israeli diplomats, family members, and musicians gathered to honor fallen IDF soldiers and victims of terrorism at a program for Yom Hazikaron. Israel's Memorial Day at the 92nd Street Y. The holiday falls between Holocaust Remembrance Day and Israel's 67th Independence Day and is an emotionally charged time for the country, Ambassador Ido Aharoni said. This 10-day annual cycle serves as an internal reminder to the duality of Jewish and Israeli history and present. It's the close proximity between the holidays which makes the time so sentimental, the ambassador said. You're going from grief and sorrow to jubilation and celebration overnight, and that's not easy. Very few people uh, will tell you that it's an easy thing to do. Ambassador Aharoni recounted just how many people Israel has lost defending its borders and security. 23,320 men and women who gave their life in our constant battle for survival. In the past 12 months, since Memorial Day 2014, we get it right here, exactly a year ago, 116 soldiers and security personnel fell while serving their nation. 67 of them were killed while fighting in Gaza during Operation Protective Edge. Park East Synagogue Rabbi Arthur Schneier was also on hand to comfort the bereft. And those families in Israel who are visiting these military cemeteries today, 
Israeli native and now New Yorker Perry Hyman remembered his own father, who he lost during service and never met. I met him through stories and through pictures, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess people telling me that um, we have the same um, as far as spiritual connection to people and behavior in a way of how he used to treat other people. Um, and basically, it's, 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 it's hard to, 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 you know, it's hard. For more from Yom Hazikaron, Israel's Memorial Day, tune into the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. Thank you, Meredith. Finally, this week on Up Close, women's advancement is a major goal for many, and we're now seeing a new generation of women as CEOs of at least a few of America's largest companies, exemplifying two very different approaches to getting to the top of the corporate ladder. At two companies that are quite different from each other are GM's Mary Barra and Yahoo's Marissa Meyer. Barra's story is told by Bloomberg News reporter at large Laura Colby in Road to Power, how GM's Mary Barra shattered the glass ceiling, and then Silicon Valley's most most prominent female CEO is profiled by business insiders Nicholas Carlson in Marissa Meyer and the fight to save Yahoo. Here are some of the highlights from my interview with Laura Colby. Why is it such a big deal that we have a CEO of General Motors who's a woman? General Motors is, uh, has often been considered a, a proxy for the American economy. I don't know if that is still the case these days, but um, Having a woman lead a company like that that has such a long and rich history is, is really a barrier-breaking thing as opposed to a smaller company, a more entrepreneurial company. This is a big uh, pillar of corporate America. And you broadly, you cover a lot of issues relating to women in the workplace, women in corporate America. How different is it to have a woman CEO, to have women in top executive leadership at a major corporation in the United States? Some, some of the uh, studies show that women who are uh, when companies are led by women, uh, they will have better results, better financial results. Um, and there are a whole bunch of different explanations for that. Uh, but one of the biggest ones is that they tend to avoid the sort of groupthink that you get when you have a, an all-male boardroom, an all-male CEO suite. So how, how did she get there? It, it seems that it was, it's not, it's not the most straightforward path, and it's something that involved really changing GM's corporate culture. Yeah, well, that's, um, that's what intrigued me about doing and made me want to do this book in the first place. How did she get there? Um, and it really is one of the great sort of American success stories, if, if you will, because she's a lot of times you'll see um, women who succeed. They may have had sort of a leg up some way or another. Maybe they're uh, by birth or by, you know, connections or something like that. But she's really, um, she's a working class, comes from a working class family. Her father was a dye maker at GM, so she didn't come from a wealthy family. She didn't come from a very highly educated family. Her parents didn't go to college. Um, and so she really, uh, she pulled herself up on her own bootstraps through smarts, through working hard, and very importantly, for the company having uh, a whole suite of programs and, and um, metrics about getting women into the management ranks. To the degree that she, uh, that she was able to, to get herself to the top and, and, and use all these various resources and systems and, and support and to help get her there, were there various points where it seemed like she was being treated differently as a woman? She wouldn't call it this discrimination, but you know, working as an 18-year-old, 19-year-old in the factory, there were there was a lot of uh, you know sexual harassment. Um, there were people you know whistling when you walked into the factory. It wasn't just her; it was you know any young woman who was who was embarking on that career. So that must have been uh, uh, pretty tough. I don't think she got actual special treatment for being female going up through the through the ranks. I think really what she got is sort of the ability to be treated the way a talented man would be treated. And that was a big that was a big breakthrough. 
You can see the full episode of Up Close on the Jewish channel on cable. You can also listen to the full audio of Up Close as a podcast available on iTunes or in your favorite podcast player. That's all for this week. From all of us here at the Jewish channel, be well. The Jewish channel is available on cable. Time Warner Cable Channel 1640, Iowa Link Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Cox Cable Channel 1, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, and on Comcast on the on-demand menu on the Jewish channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.